I'm making this guide for everyone preparing for the data annotation core assessment. I'm going to teach you everything that I know to help give you the best possible chance to pass. For those raiders out there who may have already passed, you may still find this information helpful for general tasks. Let's start with the basics of how to rate every response you will see. This will be the number one thing for you to understand moving forward for this test, qualifications, and probably most projects on the platform. So pay attention. Each response will be scored using this rubric and these main categories to keep things simple for this particular exam. Does the response actually satisfy the user intent? That is, did it directly answer the user's question or request? Next, is it factually accurate? Are the facts correct, current, and supported? Third, is the response clear? Is it easy to read and understand? Fourth, is it trustworthy and safe? Is it free from harmful, biased, or misleading content? And finally, formatting. Does it have bullet points? Is it in a list format? Or should we expect to see some sort of chart or table to make the information easier to read and understand? Okay, and some quick notable mentions before we jump in here. This exam is 14 questions. If it kicks you back out to the home screen prior to doing all 14 questions, you can probably just assume that you failed. Also note the time limit. I believe it says it's about 45 minutes to 90 minutes. Definitely make sure you do not submit it any faster than 45 minutes. It seems like most people usually spend a little over two hours anyway, so you should be okay. Also, even if you do do everything right, you could still be flagged for other reasons such as your location, or they may not just be hiring. Okay, so let's jump into what everyone came here for, the main exam. So I'm actually gonna separate these by categories. Some of the questions are basically just repeats of the same exact thing, just kind of worded a little bit differently. But the main categories that we'll be focusing on here are hallucination or misinformation errors that you should be looking at, creative prompts that are just kind of missing the mark, and then you're gonna get some prompts that are not exactly wrong, but one is still clearly better than the other, and it more closely matches the user's needs. And then finally, sort of in that same vein, the response is just not following the user's prompt closely enough. One is just slightly better. Okay, and our first prompt is, what is the capital of Australia? And where can I learn more about it? For response A, we have the capital of Australia, Sydney. Known for its iconic opera house and harbor, you can learn more about Sydney's role as the political center of Australia at www.australiagov.sydney/capital. So of course, the first things we always wanna check is the key information actually factual. So you look up, is the capital of Australia actually Sydney? And it is not. It is actually Canberra. 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 Okay, enough of that. And then second, we're going to check to see that this link actually works. So link's not verified. Just go ahead and give this a follow anyway. And of course, the link does not work. So pretty bad response so far. For response B, we have the capital of Australia is Canberra. Canberra. Uh, we already fact-checked that that is correct. Located in the Australian Capital Territory. You can learn more about Canberra's Canberra. history and government institutions on the official site here, www.australia.gov.au. And this website does work. Okay. And then to sum things up here, we would say response A contains a hallucination. The, halluc the hallucination being it's an incorrect capital and a fake URL. The URL does not actually work. Uh, we would also say response B gives the correct information with a real verifiable source. And government sources are usually some of the best trusted sites out there. So that's always good to note as well. You always want to mention response A and response B, what's good with them, what's bad with them. Okay, and up next, our prompt will be write a four-line poem about time slipping away. The two main things that we want to check for the responses are that they're each four lines long, and they're both about time slipping away. So for response A, we have time's a thing that moves. It keeps going every day. People notice it sometimes. It is always happening. And for response B, we have a shadow crawls across the wall. The echoes fade, the night birds call. I reached a hold a single day, but time just smiled and slipped away. So right off the bat here, they do both involve time, but response A just kind of falls a little bit flat, not having any sort of noticeable rhyme scheme. So I would go with response B here is better. And then your reasoning could be response A lacks rhythm, imagery, or emotional impact, making it feel flat and forgettable, which I completely agree with. And response B delivers a poetic experience that reflects the theme with elegance and depth. Our next prompt is, what's a simple way to explain inflation to a middle schooler? Response A is, inflation is when prices go up over time and your money doesn't buy as much as it used to. And response B is, inflation is like when candy used to cost $1, but now the same candy costs $1.25. Your money didn't change, but what it can buy got smaller. But you know what is better than money? Subscribing to this channel. It may not pay my rent, but it will make my day. So I think this is a perfect example of when both responses technically answer the question, but one is just clearly better. Obviously, response A didn't use any sort of verbiage that we would expect a middle schooler to understand. Response B at least tried to use a candy example. So we would say something like response A gives the definition but lacks connection or context. Response B uses a relatable example that makes the concept concrete 
and understandable for a middle schooler. I think we could all agree on that. At this stage in the exam, the answers won't always be clearly right or wrong. A lot of times we'll be working on a sliding scale. You don't have to hit the perfect answer every single time, but you do need to land on the right side of the scale. That means using common sense, intuition, and judgment to figure out which response better helps the user, even if both seem okay on the surface. To make things easier, imagine you were the person writing that prompt. What sort of answer would you actually expect to see? What would be a bad answer? What would be an okay one? And what would be a perfect answer that couldn't get any better? And the last prompt here, this one might seem a little bit familiar. Follow me on this. The prompt is, write a short four-line poem about the ocean. Response A says, the ocean roars beneath the sky. Waves crash and seagulls cry. Salted winds drift through the air. A restless world forever there. Okay. And then response B is, the ocean whispers in its sleep. A song of secrets buried deep. Its waves like thoughts come and go, telling tales we'll never know. Moonlight dances on its skin, tides pull dreams from deep within. A mirror for the sky's dark grace, endless shifting out of place. So you might notice probably two things right off the bat. One, there are two different lengths. And two, I would say that they're both different in quality. I would say response B is actually the better poem here. Response A is okay. It has like an, an all right uh, rhyme scheme, but nothing like insane. So when deciding which one is better, we're actually going to go with response A. Even though it's the worst poem, it more closely matches the user's prompt. Remember, they wanted a four-line poem and a poem about the ocean. This meets both of those criteria. Even though that this poem is technically better, it's still too long. It would technically be useless to the user. So we would say something like, even though response B is more poetic and expressive, it fails the prompt by going twice the requested length. Response A is clearly weaker, which I noted, in quality, but it follows the instructions exactly, which is often what matters most in assessment settings like this. And one more thing to mention, if all else is equal and both responses are about the same as far as responding to the user's prompt, always prefer one that is concise compared to one that is overly wordy. We want responses to have the correct amount of wording and information and nothing else. We don't want it to be fluffed. We don't want it to be overly long, sort of like this sentence right now. And if you found this video helpful, please drop a like or follow below to show some love. This will be the last video on data annotation for a while, unless something major changes with the exam or the site. I'll be focusing on taking and reviewing other AI company exams similar to this, uh, data annotation or a rating sort of job. And I've actually already currently done TELUS, which was formerly known as Lionbridge, as a U.S. Raider. And I'm also working at Outlier as well. So let me know if you would like me to review any other companies, obviously related to AI, that you may be interested in.